Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you again for joining us today. Just as uh, one more reminder, if you don't mind putting your name and your organization in the chat for us, that way we can keep track of who, who's able to attend with us today. I see that we have uh, friends from Jeff Davis and Optum here. So thank you all for joining us. Uh, my name is Chris Scoggins. I serve as Director of Special Projects at the Georgia Rural Health Innovation Center. Uh, and we have been asked by the State Office of Rural Health to give a brief overview of the ICD-11 coding and readiness um, as we are now in the process of moving to ICD-11 nationally. Um, this, of course, is one of the requirements of the SHIP grant program this year is to receive one one hour of instruction on this topic. And of course, your participation today will uh, satisfy that requirement for the purposes of the grant. Uh, and again, by putting your name and organization in the chat, we'll be able to report that back to the state office and make sure that you're checked off for that. Additionally, if there are individuals who are not able to join us today, or if you'd like to review this information at the time, the slides and a recording will be posted on the Georgia Rural Health Innovation Center website within the next week. Um, we know the July 4th holiday is upon us, so we expect that um, within a week or so. With that, um, one more bit of housekeeping. Uh, if you have any questions today, we will certainly do our best to try and answer those. If um, it's something that we can't answer immediately, we can certainly follow up with you afterwards, but my colleague, Samantha Johnson, is on the meeting today and she's monitoring the chat for any questions. So please do feel free to um, enter any questions that you do have in the chat as we go through today. Well, without further ado, we'll go ahead and jump into things. So a brief history of ICD and what this is all about. Um, of course, ICD stands for the International Classification of Disease. Um, this was an idea that's by no means new, but it currently uh, resides with the World Health Organization and they administer this program and all of its revisions. Um, ICD in one form or another has been around since 1909 um, when the first group of people thought it would be great to be able to share information across borders and organizations um, about disease in a way that we could actually um, talk to one another and understand uh, that we're talking about the same thing. This has a lot of implications for public health, tracking of disease pandemics, um, as rates of certain diseases increase or decrease. Um, but today it has a lot of ramifications within our healthcare system in the way we do business every day, how we code in our EMR and even how we uh, build. So right now we're on the 11th revision and of that um, ICD code. So that's why we're talking about ICD 11 today and the transition from 10 to 11. And again, this is just an international standard that we're using. So ICD-11 in particular was adopted by the World Health uh, Organization in their annual assembly in May of 2019 and went into effect officially January of 2022. So we're actually pretty far into this implementation. A lot of work has already been done and I'm sure many of your organizations have actually already made transitions in a variety of systems toward ICD-11. And right now, um, this January 2022 deadline was actually for each of the member nations of the World Health Organization to begin reporting data to WHO in ICD-11 format. So you can think of this as, uh, for instance, uh, you know, the, the World Health Organization is they're keeping track of COVID cases around the world um, and the United States and Great Britain and South Africa and a variety of other nations are reporting this information up to them. They're all reporting that in ICD-11 format as of January, 2022. And this 
ICD-11 format also, it didn't just change a few of the codes, but was designed to provide universal access and an online tool that could be used for input and sharing of disease information. I'll show you a little bit about some of the online tools they've made available. Um, they really did try to streamline things in a, in a lot of ways. Um, there are certainly changes, um, the adding of certain conditions and the subtraction of others, but uh, in many ways it's, it's become a little bit more streamlined. So right now ICD-11 consists of more than 120,000 medical diagnosis terms in total, um, arranged into 80 concept domains. And there are 1.6 million clinical terms involved. So it can get pretty granular. Um, and I'll show you one of the tools that helps make that a little bit easier if you're trying to, to locate a particular term for a specific disease. And this concept of semantic interoperability is really important, um, especially when you're thinking about operating across borders and between organizations. Um, another thing that ICD-11 did was actually, um, it's now available in many more languages than it originally was. So again, on the international front and how we coordinate about disease control and prevention internationally, um, there have been some pretty big enhancements. Now in the, in the hospital space and in, um, in the healthcare system in general, really the only part that we interact with is those, you know, which code are we using today and how are we terming things. Um, we don't see as much of this, you know, multiple language and interoperability in the online reporting structure as much. But that, I, I wanted to give you this because uh, I think it's important to understand that as we talk about ICD-11, it's really much bigger than just, you know, how we code data in our EMR. And the, the operational idea with IC11 again was to uh, look at public health issues like causes of death again, uh, tracking of COVID-19 deaths is a good example. Um, having surveillance capabilities again, serves a really great public health function as we have emerging diseases, making sure that we're, we're able to track those and track them in the same language. Um, and research um, is another area that they wanted to focus on by having um, information from a variety of different populations coded in the same way. Really makes it easier to, to do that epidemiology and that research to figure out um, what strategies and best practices might be applied to best treat specific conditions. Um, IC11 also enables us to look really deeply at our drug safety profiles, understanding uh, exactly what's going on so that we can track uh, any adverse events as they're happening. And, uh, and of course, cost reimbursements, DRGs, um, these kind of things are a portion of what we are doing with IC11, but certainly not the totality of it. So a few key differences between the 10th version of ICD and the 11th version is uh, basically this idea that, that they want to uh, enhance the healthcare community and the public health infrastructure's ability you know, to think on a global scale about protecting uh, individuals' health. Um, again, I keep going back to the example of pandemics. This is something that it's not a matter of if, but a matter of when, as we've talked about, and being able to really have interoperability worldwide is, is important. Um, and it also was designed to allow for more precise and detailed data recording. So again, having a few more sub options so that you can really characterize the kind of condition you're dealing with. Um, and they also divide it up so there's still simple coding, um, but then you can add in additional um, 
codes that provide additional detail. So um, in certain situations where it's not necessary to have a whole lot of granular detail, the simple coding still suffices and is available, but the complex coding um, is available if there's something more um, exotic going on or something that's not, not quite as normal. Um, again, like I mentioned before, we're now translated into 43 different languages, so a variety of different stakeholders from across the world can utilize ICE-11 and be talking about the same thing. And it was hoped that through automation and through um, some of the electronic elements of how this is reported that it will overall lower cost as nations uh, adopt this system. How much of that translates and trickles down to the individual health system level is certainly up for debate, but um, getting rid of a lot of the analog processes at the national and international level certainly was a goal. I put this timeline up again to let you know this has kind of been coming for a while and we're, you know, as part of this, uh, the SHIP grant training in this area was required. But in many cases, you know, this is kind of a done deal. It's already happened. January 2022, we've been living with ICD-11 in one way or another and interacting with it at least somewhat uh, for over a year now. So, um, but you can see as, as the World Health Organization went through their process, they um, approved different things, rolled different things out before that go live day. So what we wanted to focus on today is not so much on the individual differences in codes and how things have changed there, um, because it would not be practical for us to go through 120,000 different diagnoses and tell you all the differences. Um, what we're going to focus on today is how you get your team ready and your systems ready for transition. And many of you are probably already either through this process or at some point in it. Um, one thing that is certainly important from a personnel and team's perspective is as transitions happen of any kind, that there's, there's a point person who can, from day to day, know where the project is, understand who all the stakeholders are, and make sure that we're meeting our objectives and, and meeting key deadlines. Um, this person, when it comes to a, uh, an implementation like this, could be a clinical person, it could be an administrative person, it might be your IT person because you're having to deal with a lot of your IT vendors um, or you know, EMR vendors or et cetera. But it's important to make sure that that person is in place and identified early on. And it's important that the whole team understand who that person is and what their role is. Assessing current practices is a key step to starting this kind of transition. Um, understanding how this might influence things like revenue cycle, uh, onboarding and training of individuals. Uh, we know we have a tremendous turnover issue within rural health care and making sure that we've got a way to onboard our staff that lets them know what our current practices are. Um, this has implications in claim rejections. Are we using the right kinds of terminology? Um, were things coded differently? Is a, a locum's physician coding uh, incorrectly? Kind of understanding how that might work and how you would deal with claims rejections um, if the cause is found to be something to do with, with coding. Um, and what are your numbers? like what? understanding kind of where you are prior to any change so that as you go through that change and monitor, you can understand whether you're gaining or losing efficiency, whether we're missing things or um, kind of where we need to improve. So having a good baseline. Also understanding are there current gaps. Um, if we're moving from one system to another like ICD 11, 10 to 11, um, are there places where we haven't really uh, fully implemented or adopted or adequately used the old system? Um, and taking that into account as we begin to move to the new.
of course, we would have uh, in an ideal world, a planning phase and an implementation phase. Um, planning, of course, involving all the key stakeholders. So these might be uh, internal and external stakeholders. Um, they might be your uh, billing software people. They might be your, um, along with your coders, they might be your medical staff, a variety of different people who touch this and interact with this um, change. We need to be at the table in that, in that uh, circumstance. You would want to, of course, determine timelines and see what's going to happen. Again, um, we're a little late in the timeline here, but certainly understand what your, your milestones need to be and when you want to accomplish things by. Determining the support structure, uh, this is key in any change. As people have questions, who's going to support them and how do they access that support? Um, if you have external vendors like EMR vendors or billing software vendors, um, who on their team is going to support your team through that transition? And of course, communicating to people. Uh, this is where I've seen many, many initiatives and changes within organizations fall flat is that um, you just have to communicate and communicate and communicate multiple times over multiple modalities to get this information out so that people are all on the same page. Of course, in the implementation phase, monitoring is key to make sure that we're making our we're making progress in the way that we want and that we're hitting all the, the benchmarks that we want, making sure that our numbers are staying where we need them to be. Again, if our, if our transition process is causing a delay in uh, billing, if it's causing a delay in you know, accounts payable for some reason, we need to know that immediately so we can start making some shifts there. Um, comes from constant measurement, making sure that that point person has access to all the data that they need to make those judgment calls. And then of course, adjust as you go. Um, again, if the plan was uh, to execute in one particular area and then we found out that that caused a tremendous delay in, in billing, we need to make adjustments and, and find out a way that we can work around that. Um, make sure that our, our core mission and objectives are still being met even as we go through the transition. When it comes to software, and again, uh, ICD-11 is gonna really matter most when it comes to your electronic medical records, things like meta, uh, revenue cycle management software, if you're using any um, medical billing software, um, if you're using third parties to manage any of these uh, functions, definitely need to engage them, have a conversation, or just even, and some of them may have uh, pushed these updates out um, automatically and might not communicate very much with you about it, but touching base with them to understand kind of where they are and what they have done and what changes have happened. Um, many of you may be a part of a health information exchange. Um, that's another area where this will, will come into play. So again, engaging those partners, talking with them, understanding where they are in the process and kind of where they expect to go. Um, again, we're kind of late in the game, so many of them have probably already made substantial changes or movements in this area, but uh, always good to ask if you're not sure. Uh, and there's also the possibility of, of uh, there being a mismatch between some of your vendors, your, your EMR folks might be moving more quickly than your billing folks. Um, and being aware of that is certainly critical in understanding where there may be miscommunication because again, that could ripple through the organization in a variety of ways. And again, with each of these external vendors or with each of your software um, vendors, making sure to discuss technical support there, both local technical support, but also offsite technical support with those individuals um, and really knowing who, who is gonna be the point person on their end to fix problems as they arise. Because as I mentioned before, being adaptable through this process is key and you need to be able to make very quick changes um, if things aren't going to plan. So having that technical support available uh, as soon as possible is always good. 
So from here, I wanted to um, show you one of the tools that's available. Um, I'm gonna stop my share and reshare just to make sure that we are all seeing this. Excellent. So, um, this is a browser and I'll provide links at the end to several helpful resources that we've compiled for you. Uh, but this is the new um, browser that WHO has put out to help uh, with some of the nitty gritty questions about how things should be coded. Um, and I just wanted to make you familiar with this if you have specific questions about um, a specific disease state. So as you can see here, all 26 of the domain areas for ICD-11 are listed, um, as well as the there's a supplementary section and there are some extension codes as well. Um, and you can navigate through this um, from top level to more specific. Um, for instance, here we've got cerebral palsy and then going down and down and down until we get to a very specific diagnosis where it gives you the description uh, of what that means. The other way to uh, navigate through this um, is actually to just, you can just search. If there's a term that you've been using and you need to know if it's the same or you need to see if there are um, additional depth codes, you can put it in here. Um, so for instance, in trauma. Um, and as you can see, you've got a variety of different things that have to do with trauma. And it also brings in what are called meta terms, which are terms that uh, are analogous to trauma or might be used alongside trauma. But um, it's not just searching specifically for that word. So um, if this is really helpful, because if you're not entirely sure uh, what the term should be for a specific thing, you can you can find some of that. So in this case, um, if I look for trauma, I also get a lot of injury descriptions too. But at any point, um, you'll see that um, you'll get your major code um, any notes about this, and then if there's an associated diagnosis code, um, you'll also have the ability to kind of work for that and search further. So um, again, this is a neat little tool that just kind of allows you to browse through what's there um, and search as needed. This is probably something that on a day-to-day -day basis you don't really need, but um, if you're having a hard time locating the specific code that you need to apply to something, uh, this tool is available. And just making sure we can see the screen. Good. All right. And just recently, the State Office of Rural Health sent out a notice from Health and Human Services uh, seeking feedback on ICD-11 implementation. Uh, this request for information is open through August 3rd. Um, so if you have any feedback about this or would like to uh, enter a comment to HHS, I would encourage you to look at submitting a comment. Um, they're interested in the um, ease or lack thereof of the transition and, and what might could be done to support hospitals in particular. I think it's especially critical that the voice of rural hospitals be heard in this discussion because as we know, what's good for the large tertiary centers in Atlanta and Memphis and New York is not always good for us out here. So um, I would encourage you if you do have feedback about this process to to submit that for consideration so that uh, the voice of rural hospitals can be entered into that discussion. Um, again, this link will be available in the slides when they're posted, but uh, you all should have received this email from the State Office of Rural Health 
as well. And again, we've got a couple of links here that uh, I've provided for everybody just as a way to, uh, for additional reading or information if you need it. Um, this article at the very beginning is a very helpful, um, easy to understand article about how you approach some of the software um, implications of IC11 transition. And then these three links give you um, one, the browser that I just showed you, also um, a very thorough guide document on ICD-11 and the, the total documentation. This is kind of the ICD-11 Bible. Um, and then of course, WHO's main page on ICD-11 is here that kind of tells you that a lot of general information. Okay.